Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time today, following up on something from back in 2014. Sonic Super Special number 7. It was an odd little book that featured a bunch of cameos of Image Comics characters, as well as Mulder and Scully from the X-Files. Is it weird that I've covered at least two comics now where those two randomly make a cameo? But yeah, the story was about a character named Particle who traveled from the future, or another dimension or something, to steal the Master Chaos Emerald for an evil villain who apparently would be important to Knuckles later, according to him. He also was never given a name in the book, and the Image characters barely interacted with the Sonic characters, to the point where Spawn was just randomly standing in an alley and then left. Truly the wisest to emerge from all the early Image characters. As I have pointed out several times now, I am not a reader of Sonic comics, and my enjoyment of The Fastest Thing Alive is more just from, like, the Sega Genesis games. As such, I just figured that Particle and Beardo Von Dorcas were characters from the Sonic comic, probably premiering there, but getting a bigger role in later issues. And thus Sonic fans were happy to point out, NOPE! Sonic Super Special No. 7 is actually a backdoor pilot to writer and artist Ken Pender's own original series, The Lost Ones. Some of you may be expecting me to go into some long, detailed history of Ken Penders, but I honestly feel like there's no point. Most people who are Sonic Comics fans already are well aware of his deal by now, given his actions ended up completely screwing over the Sonic Comics and forcing them into massive reboots that'd make DC envious and how much they had to expunge of their history. And if you're not aware of Ken Penders, well... Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. Ken Penders was a longtime writer and artist on the Archie Sonic the Hedgehog comics and created a significant amount of lore and backstory, particularly for Knuckles the Echidna, his race, and his family. And then he sued Archie Comics and claimed that all of that belonged to him. As I said in the review that this is a follow-up of, normally he would have no case because this kind of licensed comic is a work-for-hire thing, but due to Archie's own incompetence, particularly from their legal team, they couldn't actually produce the original contract that outlined this, and consequently he ended up owning the rights to a bunch of Sonic spin-off characters from one comic series that he ended up destroying, preventing even reprints of this material because there's no way in hell Sega would pay this guy for the rights to reprint the material. He has claimed for a long time that he will continue the story he had been working on in Sonic Comics under a new title and, well, with this artwork, but the series is quickly becoming the Duke Nukem Forever of comic stories. Overhyped for it, constant revisions and new ideas, and a development hell time period that strains credibility over if any actual work is being done. Maybe it'll be released like that game eventually was, but like Duke Nukem Forever, will anyone care when it does? And will it have been even worth the wait? If you want more details of everything that went down with Ken, I'd recommend the video Comic Drake put out about it. Although, let's be fair, you've probably already seen it because he is much more popular than me. And if you want any more details about the stuff Ken Penders was doing in the comics, then I'd recommend the Thanks Ken Penders Tumblr. But again, we're not actually talking about any of the Sonic stuff today. We're here to talk about his wholly original material, and if that's any good. Shockingly, this book came out two years after the Sonic Super Special, so I'm confused how there wasn't a legal issue earlier. In 1998, I'd imagine any characters introduced in the book would belong to Sega because of the Work for Hire contract, and thus he couldn't use them in anything else unless they had premiered elsewhere first. Although maybe Sega just didn't care about these characters enough to even bother. He also apparently had ambitions to turn this into a movie. He even made a concept trailer for it, which, uh... Yeah. That's... something, certainly. Yeah, sure, best-selling, totally. Not even breaking the top 200 is best-selling now. So let's dig into Ken Pender's The Lost Ones and see if it deserved to have something more than just this one-shot. <laughs> It could be your turn. 
The cover's okay, though a little busy in weird ways. The central image features a woman being hunted from the perspective of what seems to be a cyborg or a Terminator or something. But to properly frame the robot text, they compress the visual down to just a rectangle that's at a Dutch angle. It's kind of unusual, but not terrible. No, the busyness comes about because of all the text, and said text is in a bunch of different fonts. We've got the logo, not a bad one either, but then you've got Ken Penders' name in this weird faux Japanese font kind of in the middle of it, and then right above that, some promotional text in a different font and color to help it stand out, but then the same faux Japanese text is on the left in a different color for a website address. And of course, the one thing you want to do for a website address that you want people to visit is make it harder to read. Sure, you can make it out when you turn the comic that it says thelostones.com, but I swear to God, glancing it on its side, I thought it said Helios because of the font. Then farther down, we have Pender's, well, signature, I guess you can call it. More like a kind of copyright indicator given the year, though without the copyright symbol, which makes me think instead he just randomly wrote Pender's 2000 on it. Maybe this is a signature, and what we're seeing on the cover is from this thing's perspective. The Pender's 2000 drawing robot! And aside from it being in yet another different font than the others, we have The Hunt Begins at the bottom. It's the same font as the text at the top, but a different color and size. They're out there. Hidden Among Us. Among Us is such a great game that they were promoting it even this far back. You're about to discover... The Ken Penders' is Lost Ones! Yeah, I know the name isn't in there like that, but that's what happens when you shove your name in the middle of the logo. Anyway, before we get to the story itself, we have a little blurb on the credits page to establish our premise. Kudos there. Welcome to the future. There's a complimentary fruit basket waiting for you in the future's hotel room. Where every home is jacked into the internet with high-speed transmission. And widescreen is the accepted format for every form of digital video media. <laughs> like that's ever gonna happen. Where a flight from New York to Tokyo is just under four hours, and Boston to Los Angeles is a daily commute. Okay, the former is still not a thing, but the latter? Yeah, I could see some people doing that. I wouldn't recommend it, but hey, I'm not like a rich businessman with a private jet or whatever. Where the beaches along the Great Lakes are far more valuable waterfront property than the ocean fronts of either coastline, by virtue of the abundance of fresh water versus the lack thereof. I mean, I've been telling all my friends to move to Minnesota for years now, so this is starting to look like our old future. Where there are only two kinds of people, those that matter, and everyone else. And that's really the attitude of people who would have a commute from Boston to Los Angeles. Or to put it another way, there's the lost ones, and then there's you. So, I matter? Yes, I made the cut! We open with some more setup, including our cover lady poking at some water. Where do you come from? Where are you going? The lesser known questions asked in Babylon 5. These are questions we all ask of ourselves at one time or another. While some can trace their family lineage back hundreds of years, there are those who literally haven't a clue who their parents are. That's when we call in Jerry Springer. Then there are those born to wealth and privilege. And those born to spelling errors, their lives predetermined, while the majority struggle merely to survive another day. For a select few, born without an awareness of where they came from, but with an ability to reshape a world, they now find themselves at the most important crossroads of their lives. Should they try to sell their world-changing product via infomercial? This is their story, all about how their lives got flipped, turned upside down. The next page is a lot of text and a bit of rambling. Some people think the past is whatever just took place, the present is what's happening, and the future only something to look forward to. Very rarely is ever linking cause and effect. I was like that myself. Then I met the ghosts of Christmas. The narrator talks about how he never really cared about history in his youth, that he should have given the chain of events that would be caused going all the way back to the morning of July 31st, 1945, during the Potsdam Conference that was determining the future of post-war 
for Germany, and the authorization to use the atomic bomb on Japan. And with that signed order, Truman had determined the future for everyone at a cost beyond anyone's wildest imagination. What do you mean this individual sheet of paper costs $20? We cut to the present, er, uh, the future anyway, but it's their present and, uh, we cut to Monday. I actually thought it began with a phone call on a routine Monday. Sikorsky, just finishing some reports. What? Is my refrigerator running? The hell kind of question is that? Sikorsky, along with his partner Takata, are on their way to Reagan International Airport, along with a bunch of other future cops. They've been ordered to arrest a Japanese-American woman arriving on a plane, and they're taking a lot of heavy firepower to bring her in. But no actual explanation for what she's done has been offered. Who cares? Probably some techno-terrorist with classified information. My god, she cracked the YouTube algorithm! We have to stop her! Unknown to me at the time, at that exact same moment, there were others north of the American-Canadian border after the same objective. Canada calls to ask, what are you guys doing up there? Agent J of the Men in Black here is apparently one of those others, and he talks to someone over a communicator how somehow the target isn't among those waiting to go through customs. However, this is also a case of the panels being arranged in the wrong order. The dialogue flows from right to left, then down and over again. I have no idea why the hell can arrange it like this. Is there another way she could exit without anyone noticing? Highly doubtful, sir. This is a high-tech facility with state-of-the-art security. I mean, they made her take off her shoes and everything. We soon see the target on this splash page, Kerry Kurosawa. Where indeed do you begin a hunt for one of the most unusual human beings ever to walk the planet? Uh, Twitter? A being whose abilities not only make her unique among her own kind, but also one of the most dangerous and elusive to capture. For she wields the power to control the electron, whether it operates the nervous system of an organic being or the functionality of the most advanced microchip, although mostly she uses it to skip lines in coffee shops. Kerry Kurosawa was her past. Today she is... Particle! One of the lost ones, trademark. Yes, this is Particle, our protagonist from the Sonic Super Special issue, seen here in her... Honestly, kind of cool-looking circuitry-inspired jacket. No kidding, it's actually a really cool design for a jacket. No doubt to look futuristic, but just honestly spiffy. The narration says she just wants the freedom to live her life like anybody else. The dogs are already out for me, but this is one fox who won't easily be caught. Yeah, just look at those two neat little smartwatches she's got on her. She'll be fine. And yeah, the writing does seem to have a little bit of that Frank Miller-esque emphasis of words, but it's not quite as egregious. Usually for things that should get emphasis, though it still seems a bit awkward at times. She heads to the airport parking garage and uses her powers to steal a car, hoping she'll be able to reach the Canadian-American border in a couple of hours before the car is reported stolen. We see a jet of the future and it looks weird, like the wings are actually serving as landing wheels and there are tiny wings up near the front along with huge jets on a very thin looking tail fin. Somehow I doubt this design, even with future tech, is something that could fly. Takata and Sikorsky are revealed to be FBI agents and show a picture of Particle to the flight attendant on the plane, but she says nobody who looks like that was on it. They ask to see a passenger manifest and we cut to another flashback of 1945, where the flight crew is told about the atomic bomb they're gonna be dropping. It is the most destructive weapon ever produced! We think it will knock out everything within a three mile radius. So for the love of God, can you please stop dead? Daring each other to kick it! Now, if someone will please dim the lights... Sorry, sir, the film is getting chewed up in the sprockets. Well, we were gonna show you a comedy movie before you slaughtered thousands of people, just to lighten the mood a bit, but Gary over there keeps getting butterfingers! But yeah, after telling the crew of the effects of the explosion itself and swearing them to secrecy, we cut back to Particle as she arrives at the border. My birth certificate may state I'm an American, but driving a car with Canadian plates is still going to arouse some questions. Like, where are my poutines and Timbits? Or why can I still go to Toys R Us? Fortunately, I have an edge. Please state your citizenship. American. Wow, American? Go on through! 
She shows him her identity card. Hayaku. Hayaku! Hayaku means hurry up in Japanese. Particle likes to pepper some of her thoughts and word balloons with random Japanese words, something Penders explained in the back pages of the comic that it's to show that despite being American, she grew up in Japan and thus will sometimes lapse into thinking or saying Japanese in stressful situations. Fair enough, but it feels kind of unnecessary when your audience is primarily English-speaking anyway, and you don't even supply a translation until the aforementioned back pages, where you have to read through a lot of stuff before even getting to that translation. Admittedly, though, it is better to do it like this than to have the translation right next to it, since it avoids an all-according-to-Keikaku situation, wherein you wonder why they even bothered to do it at all. Keikaku means plan. She did some reprogramming to her identity card that registers her under a different name. The customs officer asks her about the car, which she just explains belongs to her uncle and she's borrowing it while hers is in the shop. He buys it and lets her go, though she thinks she's not entirely in the clear yet because lots of people are still after her. We cut over to FBI headquarters, where Sikorsky and Takata are being debriefed by their superior about how they were unable to find Particle, to the point where nobody on the plane had even seen her. We've also got another bad case of word balloon formatting. It moves from left to right, but we follow the word balloons up and then down and to the left for the rest. It's shockingly amateurish for someone who'd been in the industry for so long. Anyway, Takata is dismissed, but Sikorsky is told to stay. Something weird was going on, and I could tell from Takata's expression he felt the same thing. I was then recruited to be the FBI's new mascot character, Fetty the Federal Agent. Sikorsky is given new orders to head to Buffalo, New York, but isn't given any details about what exactly he's investigating. Apparently, a higher authority believes something in Buffalo, New York is of sufficient importance to warrant sending an agent. Turns out her boss was just really confused about New York-style pizza. As I walked out of that room, I couldn't help but wonder about the other poor souls in history who were given orders of dubious merit from their government. We then cut back to 1945 and the flight crew for the Enola Gay. Oh, yeah, getting vague orders from your superiors is totally comparable to the guys who dropped an atomic bomb on people, Sikorsky. Truly kindred spirits here. The base chaplain meets with Colonel Tibbetts to offer them a prayer before they fly out, though the colonel thinks that God won't be giving his blessing for what they're about to do, though he'll worry about his conscience later. I've known you too long to believe that, Paul. I also know that you kept your men in the dark about this mission, so they wouldn't have the chance to contemplate their actions. So I looked this up, and indeed, Paul Tibbetts Jr. was the aircraft captain of the Enola Gay, which dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And from what I could tell, he had absolutely no real regrets about it. He apparently said he slept with a clear conscience the rest of his life, and while he may have had a few emotional misgivings, that he believed that it was the best way to end the killing as quickly as possible. He even apparently got mad that the Smithsonian's 50th anniversary exhibition of the Enola Gay focused on the deaths of Japanese civilians. Regardless of your feelings about the bombing itself, it seems kind of iffy for the comic to present a real-life historical figure who was still alive at the time the comic was published, and try to present him as tortured about it, when by all accounts, he didn't didn't seem to be. Colonel, do you know why God created the devil? Because God hates Spider-Man's marriage too. Because the Almighty knew he needed someone to do the dirty work in order to protect his children. I must have missed that part of Ecclesiastes. We got over to Buffalo, New York, where Particle is arriving in the stolen car. Okay, obviously I was mistaken. I was under the impression she was crossing from America into Canada, not the other way around, because of the establishing stuff in the airport. She was fleeing from an airport just like the agents were searching through one. I figured she used, like, her electron powers to scramble people's memories of her being on the plane, but it looks like she wasn't actually there. It's kind of the problem when you don't differentiate the two locations at all. She arrives at a house and thinks some Japanese, which Penders translates in the back as, I really don't belong here, or I don't think I should be here. But I ran it through Google Translate, and aside from generally screwing up the anglicized spelling a bit, it actually translated as, I should be here. So I guess there's some debate in her head right now about whether she should be there or not. Although I bet there'd be a lot less confusion in my part about it if he had just written it in English. She says she hasn't been here since she was four and thus has no emotional connection to it beyond it being where she was born. 
But enough of that, inside the house is a cyborg. Nine, as he's called. And he says she may be the one they're looking for. He's working for Romulan Beard Guy, the villain from the Sonic Super Special. And I'm not just calling him a Romulan because of the pointy ears, but because his speech balloons are using a Star Trek font. He orders Nine to keep an eye on her. And I guess does more than that since she goes up to the house, which is locked with a key card reader like it was a hotel, enters, and he comes downstairs and we see that someone screamed. It wasn't because of Nine, she just really hated the decor. She wanted to be held again. Sikorsky arrives at the FBI field office in Buffalo, where the agent in charge says that headquarters usually only sends them their most unwanted agents. Really? Seems rather nice around here. Didn't their football team just win a Super Bowl? They're third in a row. The quarterback has a gun for an arm. I'd actually watch football if the players shot each other with cyborg gun arms. He explains how he's here about the Kurosawa disappearance, which the lead agent says is something they've been investigating for years, but they haven't had a lead in a while. Because of the sighting of Particle and that Buffalo is her family's last known address, they think she might return to the area. After another flashback to 1945, where they armed the bomb at 2.42 a.m., don't know how accurate that is considering they wouldn't reach Japan for several more hours, that I'm not going to dwell on at this point, we cut back to Sikorsky as he drives over to Particle's family house. He wonders what the hell is so special about her that the government is hell-bent on arresting her. I was directed to arrest her on charges that in plain English were nebulous at best. She did a bad thing that was very bad and also might have been against the law. Also, her face is dumb and she won't tell us where she bought her jacket. They said she was extremely dangerous, but not how she was. He figures that if they were after her, others might be too. And if so, what secrets would I find possibly unlocked in here? My god! She knows the Colonel's 11 secret herbs and spices! Another of the cyborg agents of Dr. Beardo, or whatever his name was, named 13, steps out and attacks, ordered by him to eliminate any witnesses. Sikorsky is armed with... Well, what I can generously call a water pistol there, though he will refer to it as a revolver. Tell me, which part of that thing revolves, dude? He's easily smacked around by 13, until Particle comes up behind him and touches his head, which apparently shows an image of the Hiroshima bombing, I think? Otherwise, why are these images overlapping? This not only disables the guy, but fries the connection with his boss. And hey, it is Star Trek. There are no seatbelts. It's fortunate I broke the link with 13 before the feedback hit maximum surge. Otherwise, the console wouldn't be the only piece of equipment with fried circuits. In retrospect, maybe I shouldn't have plugged 20 different power cables into the same outlet. He wants to know what happened to 9 and 13, and we quickly return to Particle and Sikorsky. He introduces himself. Julian Sikorsky, FBI. I heard you already met Agents Mulder and Scully. We once again have a weird layout of word balloons. We start here, then move down, then move all the way up, and then down again as if this was some kind of zigzag. He figures that she's Kerry Kurosawa and says he was sent to arrest her, but he's not exactly rushing to do so after she saved his life. He wants to know what this is all about and why the particle code name. You're a government agent and you don't know? Contrary to popular belief, not all of us are in on the conspiracy. I'm the government. I'm the government. I'm the reason nothing works. He puts away his gun as a sign of trust, and she explains that ever since she was a little girl, she's had these abilities and people have been chasing her. Her mother took her sister and went off with her while she's been separated from her father for over two years. Though it is kind of weird that if this flashback panel is to be believed, she apparently aged up by ten years in two years. Anyway, she says she's been looking for her family ever since the separation. She asks what happens now, and he decides to let her go. You better get going. I have to call in the medics for our friend here. Not for the injuries, mind you. I can just tell that he has food poisoning. She mentions the other one that she apparently knocked out upstairs, explaining that she's never killed anyone even in self-defense. I should have handed in my resignation right then and there. Although no one else would have seen it because I'm the only one in the house. My assignment was to take Carrie Kurosawa into custody, and I let her go just like that. How could I justify my actions? Ah, uh, you could... Lie, I guess. Say you heard a noise, went in to investigate, and managed to knock out the two yourself, or found them knocked out already. And then you can keep investigating what this is all about. Just a thought, I guess. There were too many questions and not enough answers. For example, if we're in the future, why haven't Arby's potato cakes been restored yet? Where's the outrage? 
And so our comic ends with Sikorsky realizing that he forgot to even ask if she had any leads on her family, or if she knew who the people after her even were. Maybe someday I'd find out. Someday, but not today. I wouldn't put any bets on tomorrow either, dude, since this never got a second issue. This comic is... Okay for the most part, but it's got some surprisingly sloppy parts to it. The most obvious of course being how many times word balloons have not been placed in a natural reading order. It's just weird that that happens so often. I can understand maybe the layout giving trouble in a single page for how to put the word balloons in natural spots, but it was like four or five times. In addition, some pages have a lot of exposition text on them. Not insanely so, but you normally want to reduce this many lines of text in one box, spread it out, and really emphasize the important lines, but here it's all exposition. Otherwise, the artwork is mostly fine. Nothing too egregious, but nothing all that interesting either. The writing is certainly not the worst I've seen, and it's not a terrible starting point for a plot. Of course, some of the weird meandering, like why all the 1945 stuff, would have probably made more sense if we had gotten more issues, but as it stands, it's just this weird tangent we keep going back to for no adequately explained reason. What's also weird is that this seems like a prequel to the Sonic stuff, since in that, Particle finds and recovers her sister. This is not a terrible book, but it's not anything great. Maybe if it had gone on, we'd have had a classic. As it is, it's just kind of meh. Next time, the Patreon-sponsored extravaganza can continues with some alternate possibilities to how things could have played out in Star Wars Infinity's A New Hope. The last few pages of the comic, like I said, feature some expository stuff about the world, the language, etc. Not really all that important, especially in light of this being the only issue, though I do find it hilarious that it declares the second issue is coming May of 2000. The back cover even has a big ad for it. It also shockingly has a fan art page and an ad for a t-shirt you can order for the series. Please, someone get me one of these t-shirts.